Hello, and this is a recording from yesterday's webinar, which uh, didn't go so great because of the internet connection. So uh, I thought I would just go through quickly the slides and the, the screenshots and the information that I had yesterday and actually record it and then upload it. So uh, people who were unable to see yesterday due to the technical issues uh, can see all the information. So let's go ahead with this. Okay, so to start off with, where are we with the in the markets right now? As you can see on the right-hand side, the chart showing the SPX uh, is now at all-time highs. Every sell-off has been bought. The US market summary template in EdgeRator is a great place to look at some of the major markets and where they stand and how they've been performing. This is in a timeline, so... It goes from the top to the bottom of the screen, but the last entry is at the bottom of the screen. So on Friday, uh, we have this set of columns here, which represents the percent B one day change. So how far the index has moved within its percent B range. And then the, the group of columns uh, just to the right of there are the same major market indexes, except now it's looking at just pure percent B. So where they currently sit within their Bollinger Bands. And the whole idea here is not to look at the numbers, but to look at the colors. Um, so if there's anything significant happening in the percent B one day change, it gets a color of red if it's a, a bearish type of thing. And red is a one day change in the market, um, quite a large percent B one day change. And a blue is what is known as a kahuna in HGSI terms. And that is a large one day change to the upside. Um, in the percent B columns, green means that stocks are sitting in a reasonable position within their Bollinger Bands. They're above the mid band, uh, and I think the, the thresholds to make this green are something like uh, 0.7. Anything above 0.7 is green. Then you have yellows and then reds down when the indexes get to the lower parts of their Bollinger Bands. So out of the major markets, at the moment and what we have i'll just list these in order you've got the uh the spx the dow jones industrial average nasdaq 100 nasdaq composite russell 2000 s p 100 s p 1500 mid cap 400 and the new york composite and so currently as you can see uh, there was nothing significant in terms of one day change on Friday, but uh, everything is green here except for the NASDAQ 100 and NASDAQ composite. So everything else is at new 52 week highs, sitting uh, you know, nicely in their Bollinger Bands, either above the upper Bollinger Band or towards the very top, such as the uh, mid cap 400 here is towards the top of the Bollinger Band. Um, but the NASDAQ 100 and NASDAQ Composite are underperforming. Um, the way that this chart works is you, you, you look for a horizontal row of a particular color in the one-day changes, and this tends to lead to turmoil and more volatility in those indexes. So you, if, you're, if you're looking for uh, safer times to trade, that would be when the columns on the right are in the green area. Uh, when they're yellow and red, then there's there's volatility. Um, and what you normally see is a row of red followed by some turbulence in the market on the right-hand side. And then the all-clear is normally given by a row of blue or a couple of rows of blue. Um, but as you can see, the markets have been mostly green recently. Uh, but rows of red are something you should really pay attention to. Here's a row of red right here. And in this particular case... Nothing really uh, came of that, um, but that that's a warning sign. And you might look at that and say, well, that was a great time to, uh, to, to buy. Uh, and potentially, I mean, obviously in hindsight, that's true. Um, this is really designed to help you pay attention to uh, criteria that could potentially be bad. Um, so here's a situation where there was a row of red and that led to more vol volatility in the markets. And it didn't actually turn green until you had this almost uh, complete row of blue here. 
and that occurred right about here. Um, you had a few days of green and then you went yellow over here and then you went back red over here. So, and that's the, the case we just looked at. Okay, so you're kind of looking at this for colors and as I say, everything looks green at the moment. Okay, however, there's a few things to look at in terms of uh, where we are. We're, we are all-time highs. And so one thing that people look for if you're, when people are looking for a warning sign for a market high is the Hindenburg Omen. Now the Hindenburg Omen is normally run on the New York Stock Exchange, NYSE, common stocks only. And uh, currently there is no Hindenburg Omen. Uh, if we go back to the last time there was a Hindenburg Omen, and if I'm scrolling up through my list of uh, rows here showing the Hindenburg Omens, the last one occurred right here. You see this row says Hindi. That was four of the, the four criteria for a Hindenburg Omen were true. And if I select the, uh, first off, let me just change this over to New York Hindenburg. There we go. Uh, which also includes SPY. And that's important, as you'll see here, because what I'll do is I'll go over to the SPY column, click on SPY, and now you can see the point on the chart where this Hindenburg Omen was last fired at quite a prescient moment. Um, they're not all like that, of course, and you normally expect to see, or before a market top, you, you tend to see clusters of Hindenburg Omens. A solitary Hindenburg Omen is you know, not normally something you should necessarily be worried about, although it is, it is a warning, sit up and pay attention. Um, but there were several Hindenburg omens before that uh, top one. So we had one at this level here. There was another one right here, another one right here. And then we had that final one um, just over here. So currently no Hindenburg omen. But the four criteria for a Hindenburg omen are, and we only have one of the four are, are, are currently true. The four criteria are rising moving average. Uh, that is currently true. The uh, new highs and new lows have both got to be greater than 2.2%. That is not true. New highs are currently quite high, with 20% of the stocks have got new 52-week highs. Uh, new lows, there's a very small percentage at new lows, so that doesn't fire the condition. The McClellan oscillator is not less than zero, and that measures advancing and declining issues, um, and it's currently at 24. And then... New highs have got to be less than or equal to two times new lows. That condition is not true either. So no uh, signs of a Hindenburg Omen at the moment. Hindenburg Omen's claim to fame is that there's never been a market crash without a Hindenburg Omen firing. Uh, however, it, there are some uh, firings of the Hindenburg Omen that don't lead to market uh, sell-offs. Uh, so having said that, I then thought it would be interesting to see uh, there is a template, a couple of templates in Edgerator to do with new highs and new lows. So I decided to run that on the S&P 500. And running on the S&P 500, here's the, uh, here's the result. Let me go over to the 252-day column. So this is where I can see what stocks are making new highs over the 252 bar, which is a one-year uh, trading period. And there are currently 177 or 35% of the S&P 500 stocks, the SPY stocks, are uh, at new 52-week highs. So I wondered if that is actually a higher number. Uh, comparatively, it sounds, it sounds quite high. So a third, over a third of stocks are at new 52-week highs. And so one way that I can find out if uh, what the normal is without doing a special script for that is run the Hindenburg on the S&P 500. Because as I just showed you, one of the columns is the percent of new highs. And here you can see we have today, which is 35% uh, of those stocks are at new highs. Now, if I sort by new highs, you can see that today's value or Friday's value is 35.2. There are only three times in the last 10 years when it's been higher than uh, 35%. There was a 36% time 
when 36% of stocks were at new 52-week highs, that occurred right here. And that date was 1-26-2018. There's another time, uh, 5-14-2013, occurred right here. And then 5-15-2013, a day later, occurred right here. So they're the only three times that that has occurred uh, with a greater percentage of stocks than we have today at new 52-week highs. Uh, however, the situation today is, if you think back to where we've been over the last year, and if I just uh, pull this chart, let's just make this chart a little bigger. All right, where we've been over the last year, we're talking about May, we're at the beginning of May. So 52-week uh, highs is, is since May, and there has been a broad uh, a broad rally since May. We had the, the sell-off, the coronavirus crash, essentially, uh, down. And that ended before, before the base of that was before uh, we started in May. So already stocks were, were quite um, depressed at that point. We hadn't even recovered up to 50% of the previous high. So having stocks at new 52-week highs, uh, you have to bear that in mind. We're, we're starting from, you know, a, a lowish position. So uh, that's just one thing to bear in mind. But it does make you, uh, uh, <laughs> whenever something occurs that it's only happened uh, three or four times in the last 10 years, that's something to also pay attention to. These templates, by the way, the new lows and new highs, there's, there's one, one only new 52-week low um, in the S&P 500, and that is, let's just uh, go over here, this is where all my columns over here are set to yes, okay, this is the, the way this template works is it's telling you if there are new lows in the last n days, and n can be different numbers, so you just go all the way across here and you find uh, where it says 200 days or 252 day, 252 bars, which is one year, and the, the only stock that has uh, 252 uh, column set to yes is MKTX. So the only stock in the S&P 500 that is at new 52-week lows is MKTX. Uh, this template, by the way, is very useful. And you can do things in here like if I just uh, clear the filter on the, the column, because I had this set to just show me uh, true on the the uh, one year column. But if you wanted to find stocks that were making new uh, one month highs, you just sort by the one month column or just say yes, uh, do a filter to show only yeses on the one month column. And you can say then say, uh, for instance, a blank on the 30 day column. Okay, the difference between 22 bars and 30 bars. All right, now I've got three stocks that are making new 22 bar highs, but are not making new 30 bar highs. So you can it's a good way, an interesting way of just doing a very quick scan and filter um, to locate stocks that are moving. So then what I showed in the webinar was uh, a top-down approach using industry groups. And so I had already run the uh, industry group. Let me just uh, get that report up. So it's the good, bad, ugly report on industry groups. And looking at, I, I wanted to find out what which industry groups have been moving last week. So I just do a quick sort by week to date. So the different periods that you can find in here for percentage return are the one day period, the week to date, months to date, year to date, and then you've got all other uh, variations too, like the prior day, or two days ago, or three days ago. That's your one-day move. And then prior weeks, one week ago, two weeks ago, three weeks ago. And so just in one row, you have quite a nice uh, set of information that you can sort and filter and find um, the industry groups of interest. So just going down through the list here, we see that mining services... And when I'm looking at industry groups on the chart, I want to see a line because we only have the close price. 
We don't have an open, high, low, and close, just close for industry groups. So we can see where mining services is. Um, the uh, the highlight sh saying observing is common in Edgerator reports uh, because often you can run a report which refers to uh, prior days. And so the highlight points out the day or the bar that is being referred to in the, the spreadsheet when you click on a particular cell. So if that gets in the way, you can just turn that off. We, we In this template now, we know we're looking at the very last bar. Okay, so we've got sporting goods, metalwork and machinery, base metals, metal service center and other wholesalers, personal care services, and steel, raw material suppliers. So that had a good week, but you can see on this chart that it's it's been on fire recently, steel and raw, raw materials still produces uh, the same, and so on. So one thing that's useful here is to go in and see the components of these these uh, industry groups and so I have the warehouse it's called the warehouse report that I generate uh, and I might have to just open that up I will have to open that up that exists in my edge rate folder under uh, HDSI warehouse archive and then I've got an archive for I'll sort this by sort this by date. It goes to the very top of the list. Five seven twenty one. So that's the warehouse all securities that I ran on Friday. I'll just put that on the bottom of the screen. And these reports are linked together, magically linked together. They're, it's automatic uh, in Edge Race. You don't have to do anything special here. So now, whenever I click on a industry group in the in the top area. So whatever template you've run on that, those industry groups, this warehouse uh, report is sensitive to the industry group and then filters down to the stocks that are in the industry group. So I can see, and what I'll do here, because we've got taken up a bit more, a bit too much real estate here, is uh, I will click on this one, unfreeze it, so we can come up to just show that there, and then maybe I'll freeze panes there. So freeze panes is a feature in uh, Excel spreadsheets, but it's also carried over into the spreadsheet viewer in Edgerator. And so now, as, as we go down through, we can see mining services, there's only two companies there. Uh, when I'm looking at an individual company, then I'll, I'll use a chart for uh, with candlesticks or whatever you prefer, OHLC uh, or a couple of other you can use as well, HLC, OHLC is a good one. And candlestick. So here you can see that you've got these two stocks, which have helped to push mining services to be the best performer of the week. But there's only two stocks. So we'll see uh, if they've done well. Then that's that's going to push the group higher. Where, whereas some of the groups that have got more components, it's harder for them to uh, make the top of the list. So the fact that you've got things like base metals, which has got uh, quite a few. And I haven't counted these, but it looks like roughly 20 or so uh, issues in the base metals group. Uh, the fact that that's made it into the top for the week at 12% is quite significant. And if we uh, look at the line chart here, this is, again is the base metals industry group and how that looks. Okay, how that's been performing over time. So it's had a bit of a breakout, this industry group been on a tear and had a great week. So the components of the group are Alcoa, let's switch back over to um, candlestick chart, uh, Cameco, Sentry, Aluminum, on coal wire. You can see all of these are really doing really well. Well, not all of them, you get to something like uh, uh, Northern Dynasty, not doing so great, but Southern Copper, TGB, Trilogy Metals, URG, Uranium. Uh, so lots of movement in these base metals. And what you, what you can do, just as kind of an extra little bit of information, is you could take, you could just highlight all of these stocks here, all of the symbols, and just say, create a symbol list from those symbols and give it a name, you can call it um, whatever you want, but when you save this, you'll save it as something, I'll call it base metals, 
I already have one called base metals because I've done this before. Okay, and then you'll just do uh, an update to get updated data from whatever data provider the list is associated with. In my case, it's HGSI, but you could associate it with Edge Rata. Um, and then you could come back over to the template area and you could run the good, bad, ugly. And we'll just find that under hot topics or, or in favorites. So I have it in my favorites. So that's the good, bad, bad, ugly report. I'll run it on the base metals group. And here you can see exactly there are 20. That was a guess before. And so here we have good, bad, ugly run on those just base metals. I'll sort it by week to date. And you can see that out of the 20, 17 have been positive for the week. And here are the three that underperformed and actually were negative uh, for the week. Okay, but the rest were positive and the best performer in the base metals was HBM, Hud Bay Minerals. It's had uh, quite a stellar move here with these three solid green candles with gaps every day. Um, so that's always interesting to know. Uh, and a good way to find out using the, uh, the good, bad, ugly report on industry groups. Now, in order to get the industry groups, uh, I'm using a connection to HGSI that provides industry grouping information and data. So, and that's a, uh, if you go to HGSI high growth stock investor website, you'll be able to uh, find out how to use that data. Okay, so, Uh, so then I think finally I showed, and this is quite a brief uh, summary of what was shown in the webinar, and then finally I talked about the undercut and rally um, template in Edgerator. And this came about as a result of Gil Morales' presentation at our Pacific Northwest trading workshop, where he talked about one of his favorite setups. It's called one of his ugly ducking setups, uh, the undercut and rally. And that presentation is available on YouTube right now. If you just search on YouTube for Undercut and Rally, and you'll find the Gill's presentation at the Pacific Northwest Trading Workshop. Take a look at that because he goes into detail and with a lot of examples of, of uh, Undercut and Rally. And the Undercut and Rally template in Edgerator was something that I put together to try and um, alert the, uh, users to criteria that make up an, under, an undercut and rally. So you'll find that under, if you look on the right hand side, I'm just going to look for the uh, in the trading cockpit with the O'Neill disciple. So that's Gil Morales and Chris, Dr. Dr. Chris Cash's uh, book. And uh, that's their category. And there's a few templates in here. One is code red, code blue, viable gaps, and then the undercut and rally template. So I'm just going to run undercut and rally on, let's just run that on the list of stocks with week, that have weekly options because they're very liquid. Um, and I tend to use that for a lot of my scanning. Okay. Uh, and then if I, if I close down a lot of these other templates, I will be able to, let's just say close all but this. And I won't change, save any changes to any of the others. Okay, so now if this is the only report we're, uh, we're, we're seeing. And so here, once you've seen the report uh, YouTube video on this, you'll know that uh, Gil shows this image, which is his undercut and rally idea. Uh, so you have an area of accumulation where a stock is bouncing between an upper level and a lower level. It undercuts the lower level, signaling to... Um, traders that there's a break lower, everybody throws in the towel, and then it rallies back above that low level, or where it says spring there. That's the uh, the rally part. And uh, when you watch Gil's video, you'll, you'll see that that's where he uh, prefers to make a trade rather than waiting for, waiting for a breakout. He doesn't do breakout trades. He does these undercut and rally trades. And if he is trading or looking at breakouts, he'll wait for a throwback uh, rather than buying a breakout. So the idea with this template is to try and detect these points of lows that are then 
being rallied through. So if I look at, uh, and the way that this has been coded is it's trying to detect lows based on different granularities. There's a category one low, a category two low, and a category three low. And actually it tells you what they are in the, uh, in the template. Uh, description, category one is a low that's, that's seen a subsequent move up greater than 1%. A category two has seen a move up greater than 5%. And a category three has seen a, a subsequent move greater than 10%. So if we go back to look at the report, then there are columns in here saying if there have been any undercuts of any of those lows, uh, and that's the any column. You can say, has there, has there been an under, undercut of all of those lows or any of those lows? If I click on one here, you can see very clearly in STMP, and you can see it's marked on the chart. The chart layout is specifically linked to this template. And you can see that this low here, which is highlighted with the black dots, has actually been undercut. And so then you potentially would be looking for a rally here. And there isn't currently a rally, but there's something to uh, put in the in the watch list and, and and watch. And here is an example here with ASHR, where the uh, the more fine grained low has been undercut, and you could potentially be looking for a rally in here. There's another example. All of these have got undercuts because I've sorted them all by the S column, and then you'd be looking for the rally situation to make a decision as to whether you would be interested in trading it, but you have to look at uh, Gil's video to find out how he uh, trades his undercut and rally. And this template is just to help you find stocks that uh, might be in a position to trade. Okay, so uh, that was it. That's just a kind of a brief uh, look at the webinar from yesterday for those who had trouble viewing it due to uh, poor internet connections. And thanks for watching this. Uh, see you next time. Bye for now.